This video is sponsored by bootcamp.com. Check it out for INBDE prep and use coupon code MENTALDENTAL for 10% off. Hey everyone, Ryan here and welcome back to our oral medicine series. This video will be on pregnancy. Now a pregnant patient poses a unique set of management considerations for the dentist. And while most dental procedures are generally safe for pregnant patients, there are some exceptions where the dentist has to balance the benefits of what they're doing in terms of the dentistry aspect while minimizing or avoiding exposure of the developing fetus to potentially harmful procedures. So we'll talk about all of those things and more in this video. So a normal pregnancy will last about 40 weeks from the first day of the last menstrual period to the due date. Now the trimesters are broken into about 13 weeks each. The first trimester is when the organ systems are being formed from about zero to 13 weeks. So the baby is generally most vulnerable at this stage. The second trimester is from 14 to 26 weeks and the third trimester from 27 to 40 weeks. And while the chances of malformation are much lower in the second and third trimesters, the baby's teeth are susceptible to discoloration by the administration of the antibiotic tetracycline, which we'll talk about again later in the video. Now for reference, a preterm or a premature baby is born before 37 weeks. And from a clinical perspective, a viable pregnancy is one in which the baby can be born and have a reasonable chance of survival, which is considered 25 weeks or later is the absolute minimum to be considered a viable pregnancy. Now, as far as the trimesters, one kind of silly way to remember them is that the first is the worst, second is the best, and third is the one with the burning chest. So let me explain this. First is the worst because you have the morning sickness, constipation, extreme tiredness, and you're peeing all the time. And once again, the baby is most at risk for malformations. The second trimester is generally considered the best, and it's also the safest period to provide routine dental care. But there can also be some bad things with fatigue, back and hip pain, and more nausea and vomiting. And then third trimester is the one with the burning chest because you can experience lots of heartburn or acid reflux at this stage. Also, shortness of breath, you start to have contractions and generalized swelling. All right, so some effects of pregnancy in terms of the pathophysiology of the body. The majority of pregnant women have insufficient iron, which is a problem compounded by significant blood loss. Most studies show a mild decrease in platelet number, Several clotting factors, especially factors 1, 7, 8, 9, and 10, are increased during pregnancy, which is considered a hypercoagulable state as a result of that. White blood cells increase progressively throughout pregnancy, and that's mostly due to an increase in neutrophils, and the total lung capacity decreases by about 5% due to a decrease in the volume of the lungs in their resting state. Some complications of pregnancy include acid reflux due to increased intra-abdominal pressure, increased urinary frequency because of more pressure on the bladder, gestational diabetes mellitus is this transient insulin resistance that occurs in about 2-6% to of pregnant women, and hypertension can lead to preeclampsia which manifests as high blood pressure, proteinuria, edema, and blurred vision. And this can actually progress to eclampsia, which is a life-threatening condition. And miscarriage is the natural termination of pregnancy before the 20th week of gestation and occurs in about 15% of all pregnancies. Okay, so this next slide is extremely important. And here I've listed out the five FDA pregnancy categories for different drugs. And this is basically showing which drugs are safe to use in pregnancy and which ones are not. 
So basically how this is organized is the drugs at the top row are the safest to use, and as we go down, they progressively get less and less safe to use. How I remember what the categories mean is A is okay, A-OK, -okay. B is better than the ones that are below it, C you should be using with caution, and D for don't use, and X is definitely do not use these drugs. So when the baby is developing early during pregnancy, uh, folic acid, which is one of the A category drugs, actually helps to form the neural tube. So folic acid is very important because it can help prevent some major birth defects of the baby's brain, like anencephaly, and their spine, like spina bifida. When we go to category B, I wanted to highlight a couple of drugs here. Acetaminophen is generally considered the safest analgesic to use during pregnancy. And note that NSAIDs like ibuprofen are okay to use during first and second trimester, but not in the third trimester, where they actually get bumped down all the way to the D category, because during the third trimester, they promote premature closure of the ductus arteriosus, leading to fetal pulmonary hypertension. Note that lidocaine and prilocaine are in the B category and considered the safest local anesthetics to use in pregnant women. Epinephrine is down here in category C. There are also several antibiotics in the B category that are considered safe for treatment of infections. Most opioids are in category C. You can see we have codeine and hydrocodone, but oxycodone is actually in category B. That's the one exception there. Glucocorticoids like dexamethasone and prednisone are in category C, and nitrous oxide is also in category C. We'll talk a bit more about why that is later in the video. We also have Zolpidem, which is Ambien, that's the sedative drug that we talked about in a previous video, also in category C. Now, as I mentioned earlier in the video, we have tetracycline and its sister drug doxycycline, which should be avoided due to concerns over tooth discoloration, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. And then benzodiazepines as a drug category are either in category D or X, and so these should be avoided at all costs. Either way, if they're in category D or X, avoid benzodiazepines. Okay, so next I want to talk about supine hypotensive syndrome. It's not really a true emergency, but it is something that you should be aware of. So usually, it's not a good idea to position pregnant patients in a fully supine position, laying completely flat, especially during late pregnancy. And that's because the gravid uterus can crush the aorta, and more importantly, the inferior vena cava, which will impair venous return of blood to the heart. And this leads to decreased blood pressure, paleness, sweating, nausea, weakness, hunger for air, and dizziness with a possible loss of consciousness. And the simple remedy for this is to roll the patient onto her left side, which is called left lateral decubitus position. After this is done, blood pressure should rapidly return to normal as pressure on the aorta and inferior vena cava is relaxed, and the symptoms should subside as well. So now let's review our considerations for the pregnant patient. Building off the last slide, if a pregnant patient is ever uncomfortable laying in the dental chair for a maxillary extraction, let's say, consider using a rolled up blanket or a pillow to help improve their position from the start or keep them in a more upright position if you can tolerate it as the operator. You should monitor their blood pressure throughout the procedure and if it ever goes over 140, over 90, call their OBGYN because the patient may be at risk of preeclampsia. Now this is true for every patient, but especially during pregnancy, take only the necessary radiographs and use a lead apron and thyroid collar when doing so. 
The official statement by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists says that diagnostic radiographic procedures should not be performed during pregnancy unless the information to be obtained from them is necessary for the care of the patient and cannot be obtained by other means. So in other words, there is a risk of using ionizing radiation, but it's very, very low, and it may be required to diagnose dental health and disease of the patient. We talk about the specifics of radiation dose and the effects that it can have in our oral radiology video series, if you want to learn more about that. Elective dental care is best avoided during the first trimester because of potential vulnerability of the fetus, but urgent care, plaque control, and oral hygiene should absolutely be provided. And it's probably also best to postpone elective dental care during the second half of the third trimester because of the increasing discomfort that many expectant mothers will be experiencing by this time. You should avoid nitrous oxide in the first trimester, and if it's being used in the other trimesters, limit it to 30 minutes and deliver at least 50% oxygen to ensure adequate oxygenation at all times. Tetracycline causes blue-gray discoloration of the dentin layer of developing teeth, and it's contraindicated from second trimester all the way through eight years of age, and that's while the permanent teeth are forming. Also, along with this, swallowing excessive amounts of fluoride, and I'm talking about entire tubes of toothpaste here, would cause fluorosis, or modeling of the enamel layer, and it's contraindicated during that same time period from second trimester all the way to eight years of age. However, regular use of fluoride toothpaste, fluoride rinse, and treatments are entirely safe. You should avoid ibuprofen and other NSAIDs during the third trimester. Even oxycodone is safer than ibuprofen during this trimester. And like we said in our pregnancy category slide, avoid benzodiazepines at all costs. So at the end of the day for pregnant patients, don't be scared to provide the necessary dental work using these safe guidelines. The oral health of the mother and baby should be a top priority. So how about oral manifestations of pregnancy? Well, pregnancy gingivitis is the most common oral complication, and it's hormone-mediated, but still plaque-induced. So if there's no plaque, there's no disease. A pregnancy gingivitis also increases the risk of preterm labor, interestingly enough. There's an increased caries risk associated with pregnancy, probably due to changes in diet with a tendency towards more sugary foods and drinks, and a decreased pH in the oral cavity. Pyogenic granuloma, also called pregnancy tumor, is this mass of gingival granulation tissue with fibroblasts, macrophages, and vasculature that's most commonly found on the labial aspect of the interdental papilla. Excess estrogen causes swelling of the mucosa in the nose and upper respiratory tract, which is known as rhinitis of pregnancy, resulting in sinus congestion. Dental erosion secondary to nausea and vomiting from morning sickness is another possible side effect that can be noted on the teeth. And the patient's gag reflex also tends to be exaggerated during pregnancy. All right, so that's it for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you'd like to support me and what I do here, please check out my Patreon page. And thank you to all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock access to my video slides to take notes on, and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out, the link will be in the description. Thanks again for watching, everyone. I'll see you in the next video.